Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In today's Gospel from Luke chapter 10, Jesus speaks to different people. You can imagine the setting as one where Jesus is speaking to a large crowd. The people closest to Jesus are his disciples, and around them are other people who have come to hear Jesus speak. The first thing Jesus says here, he says only to his disciples. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. In the eyes of the world, Jesus' disciples were not great men. They were not kings. They were not famous like the Old Testament prophets. But they were greatly blessed because of what they had been chosen to see and hear for themselves. More than anyone who had ever lived, the disciples were able to see for themselves the fulfillment of the hopes and prayers of so many greater men who had come before them. But they were not shown and told these things just for their own sake. The disciples were shown and told these things so that they could then be the first wave of messengers whom God would send out into the world to preach the gospel of his promises kept in Christ. The disciples would be sent out to repeat what Jesus had told them and to recount the saving events that they would see. One of those lessons Jesus taught them right after this. We are told that one of the other people who had come to hear Jesus speak stood up and asked Jesus what he needed to do to inherit eternal life. What he meant by asking that was what did he need to do to earn eternal life for himself. Jesus replied to that man by asking him a question. What does the law say? How do you understand it? And the man replied by saying this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. What that man said was completely correct. So Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But even though that man was able to regurgitate God's word correctly, he did not actually understand what it meant. He showed this by his next question, and who is my neighbor? That man asked that question because he wanted to know who he needed to treat as his neighbor, loving them as he loved himself, and who he didn't need to treat as his neighbor, not showing them love. That, just by itself, was a very unloving thing to think, much less to ask. Who do I have to be nice to, and whose needs and feelings can I disregard? Jesus answered that man's question by telling the parable of the Good Samaritan. We need to remember what a parable is. A parable is not an account of something that actually happened. A parable is a story that Jesus told to illustrate a greater truth. But the parables that Jesus told always included realistic characters because they deal with real important things. Otherwise, what good would they do? This parable begins with Jesus saying that one day a man was making the trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, but while he was walking, he was attacked, robbed, and left half dead. And the implication here is that if no one came to help him, soon the man would die. The first person who came across this man was a priest. Right away, we would assume this is great. The man will be saved. Of course, the priest will help him. But the priest didn't. Jesus said that the man passed by the injured person on the other side of the road. After that, a Levite came. A Levite was someone from the tribe that provided all the priests for the people of Israel. In that way, all the Levites were a people set apart for God, even if they individually were not serving God as priests. But like the priest, the Levite did the same thing. He crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. The reason why these men crossed over to the other side of the road is the same reason why we might be tempted to cross over to the other side of the road if we saw a person or situation up ahead of us that we just didn't want to deal with. By crossing over the road, 
we think that we are saving ourselves from an uncomfortable interaction, whether it's with someone we don't get along with or a situation that we don't want to involve ourselves in. Now, those two men, by crossing the road, they thought that they were absolving themselves from needing to stop and help this man. But they weren't. Instead of stopping on their way to help someone who was in need, a person, by the way, who was their own countryman, they went out of their way to avoid helping him. Now, if a Levite and a priest did not stop to help this man, we would assume that he was beyond help. Soon, he would be dead. But that isn't happened. After those two men went by, another person came along, and this one stopped. He was a Samaritan. Maybe we don't all know what it would have meant for someone living in Israel at that time to be a Samaritan. But to really understand the depth of what Jesus is telling here, we do need to understand this. Now, all the way back in the 700s BC, the kingdom of Israel had been split into two halves, the northern ten tribes and then the southern two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. Now, the Assyrian Empire, they came and they conquered the northern ten tribes and they forcibly relocated many of the people to other parts of their empire. The reason why the Assyrians did this is because it was a way to consolidate their power. People were less likely to rebel if they were foreigners living in some other land compared to if they believed they were fighting to defend their homeland. And just as the Assyrians forcibly took away many of the people of Israel, they forcibly brought in many other people and settled them among the Israelites who were left. These people mixed in and married in with those Israelites, and they came to have something of a hybrid of Old Testament Judaism as their religion and culture. These people accepted the first five books of the Old Testament, but they did not bind themselves to the writings of the prophets. And the place where they worshipped was on Mount Gerizim in northern Israel, not in the temple in Jerusalem. As a whole, the Samaritans were despised by the people of Israel who were left down in Judah. The Samaritans were viewed as trash, fake Jews, if you will. The average Israelite in the time of Christ would have never stopped to help a Samaritan with anything, and they would not have expected a Samaritan to stop and help them either. But in this parable, it was a Samaritan, not a priest or a Levite, who showed true Christian love to the person in need. It was a Samaritan who went out of his way and rerouted his life to make sure that this person whom he did not even know was given the help that he needed to be nursed back to health. Now the fact that Jesus says it was a priest and a Levite who passed by the man in need does not mean that other people would not have also been obligated to stop. Any God-fearing person or any decent person would have been obligated to stop and help someone so obviously in need. But the reason why Jesus used a priest and a Levite here to make his point is because of how those two people would have been perceived. It's like how if I'm out and about and I'm dressed as a pastor with my collar on, it's obvious who I am. People will see me, and to one extent or another, they will know that I represent the Christian church. Now, what that means, in a good way, is that people will not infrequently come up to me and strike up a conversation about religion. The fact that I'm dressed as a pastor negates the social norm to not talk about religion. But it also means that I cannot act like a jerk. I need to be polite and act like a Christian pastor should. Now, I should act that way all the time, even if I'm dressed to play tennis. But when I'm dressed for my office, other people know how I am supposed to act. So Jesus had finished telling the parable, and he asked that man which person in the parable had been a neighbor for the one who had been robbed. The man replied, probably in a pained way, that it was a Samaritan. Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Jesus teaches us in this parable what it means to keep the law of God. It really does mean that we shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, 
all our strength, and with all our mind. And it also means that we will love our neighbor as ourselves. There is no limit to what it means for someone to be our neighbor. There is no individual or group of people whose well-being God does not want us to care about. Everyone is our neighbor. This is true even if that person in need is someone whom we don't like or is someone who has ignored our needs in the past. We are supposed to love other people just as much as we want to be loved ourselves. And we are not just accountable to ourselves for this. We are accountable to God. And if we don't show love to our neighbors as to ourselves, then we have sinned against God. Then we do not deserve to inherit eternal life, but we deserve to inherit eternal death. On our own, that is how we all are, beaten and robbed by sin, death, and the devil, doomed to die. And that is how Jesus, our good Samaritan, has found us. For his whole life on earth, Jesus always showed perfect love and faithfulness to God and to other people. Jesus wasn't always concerned about making people happy, but he always said what needed to be said, and he always gave the help that was needed. This culminated when Jesus allowed himself to be crucified and killed in payment for the sins of the whole world. That was the payment that all the kings and prophets who had come before him had been hoping for and looking forward to. Those who saw Jesus die on the cross and then buried in his tomb would not have known from what they saw that day that that was anything to be happy about, just to be sad about. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he gave us reason to rejoice. He showed that our sins had been paid for. He showed that he himself had been healed from everything he had gone through and that through faith in him, we are also healed in our consciences right now and on the last day also in our bodies. And as we wait for that day, Jesus continues to heal us. He has left with his church on earth the means of grace through which our, clothes, our souls are cleansed in baptism, our faith is fed and nourished in the Lord's Supper, and we are reassured of our forgiveness and salvation in the gospel. But in his word, Jesus also reassures us that we need the salvation that he gives. Like the man who questioned Jesus in today's gospel, we are also prone to self-righteousness. We are also tempted to want to carve out exemptions from the command to love our neighbors as ourselves. We're tempted to want to make the law easier and then to be comforted by how we have kept it. Jesus saves us from that false comfort by directing our attention to the law in all its truth. He shows us that we can't earn eternal life for ourselves. He shows us that because of our sins, spiritually we are like that man, dying by the side of the road. And then Jesus comes to us again in the means of grace, and he shows us that he is our good Samaritan. He shows us his true love in the gospel of forgiveness, and he makes it so that we can show true love to others. Without qualification, without exemption or prejudice, Everyone whom we need, meet in need is our neighbor. We should show them the love and help that they need just as much as God has shown us the love and help that we need. This may be physical help. In fact, often it will be. But it will also be spiritual help. The gospel of forgiveness in Christ is the help that everyone in the world needs. Everyone needs him to be their good Samaritan. And everyone who trusts in Christ, hears his word, and receives his sacraments in faith, has him as their good Samaritan. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. <laughs>